and welcome to The Spectrum Show. Coming up, I look at the games of KTEL. I play some more games. I have a chat to Jeff. And I end with a look at Spectrum Next Emulation. Let's get on then. Far from frightening, it can be great fun. You can make food. This year's most affordable food processor, the all-new Vegematic. Tells Hair Magician. This new precision instrument comes with two interchange. Now, another first. K-Tel's Bionic Glue. k -Tel, formed in the 60s, grew to be a massive worldwide organization selling a multitude of products. The Bigfoot, the Vegematic, the Hair Magician, Bionic Glue, as well as numerous compilation music and video albums. Based in Winnipeg, USA, they spread across the world from Australia to the UK, but only just survived the dot-com crash of 1988. So how did this company get to selling ZX Spectrum games? Who knows? There's no mention of it anywhere on the internet, that I can find at least, and their own website is in maintenance mode. Somehow though, someone thought it would be good to take the music compilation model and stick it into computer games setting up a new arm of the company called KTEL International. Announcements were made in magazines around May 1983 that KTEL were to produce compilations for the ZX Spectrum, releasing three tapes containing six games. They also announced a deal with DKtronics to resell 15 of their titles. The deal, worth around £150,000, would see KTEL selling games such as 3D Tanks and Dictator under their own label, or in bundles. In 1984, they expanded from their licensing model and moved into selling their own compilations called Double Siders. Each tape would contain two games from various companies and be the first of many. KTEL promised television advertisements along with media and press advertising to greatly improve sales. The first batch of games duly arrived, and the first one was It's Only Rock and Roll coupled with Tomb of Dracula. It's Only Rock and Roll was written by Kevin Smith, who later went on to write Wild Bunch for Firebirds, and it's a management game. New manager banned, and tried to obtain stardom and fame. Starting with 3,102, presumably pounds, but it doesn't say, your aim is to make one million, and collect three status symbols, whatever that may be. On starting, you are given several options, including writing a song, getting your status, trying to go on tour, and trying to make a record. If you choose to write a song, the program will produce some random lyrics that at times can be funny and at other times slightly worrying. At random intervals, events will happen, and these could be good or bad, based on a random number. Ugh, I hate random number games. Once you have a song or two, you can try to go on tour, but this may fail if, unless you've got other things in place first. You can't make a record until you've got a contract, so you just have to keep plugging away trying different things. You will need a manager, of course, and they will take a certain percent of anything you earn. Each option was greeted with awful beeps, that I thought was awful back in 1983, and now I just feel the same way. Taking a rest now and again is required, and if the random number goes your way, positive things may happen, like John Peel may like one of your songs. Starting a fan club should make money, enough to go on tour possibly, but then again you have to pay out for this. That is if you don't die of boredom first. Not a brilliant game, and probably an average typing. Along with this came Tomb of Dracula originally by Felix Software, and advertised separately before KTEL grabbed it. This game is, well, odd. You have to escape from the tomb, and are given a brief glimpse before you start. There are seven silver stakes to use on your journey, and a treasure to find if you feel the urge. When shown the tomb, I thought there was a bug in the game. It was just a load of ASCII characters. Looking at the instructions, though, these actually represent things like pits, zombies, and stairs. 
Surely the use of user-definable graphics at this point would have improved things. As you move, a very simple view of the room is shown, followed by anything that's in it. Oh no, a slime pit. Depending on the random number used to generate the tomb map, you may have to weave about, or, in one instance like me, just carry on moving north all the way. It's a dull plod through random numbers, and it's slightly exciting for about ooh, 10 seconds. Moving on then, and the next tape included Battle of the Toothpaste Tubes and Castle Coldtits. Battle of the Toothpaste Tubes is a kind of shoot 'em up. You control a large toothpaste tube, yes, only on the spectrum, and you have to destroy toothbrushes and mini tubes. The mini tubes are at the bottom of the screen, and you have to bomb these with your toothpaste. They also fire up, so you have to be fast if you want to avoid them. The toothbrushes at the right hand side of the screen also fire, and to destroy these you have to hit them on the head. If you shoot the handle, your shot will bounce back at you. Yes, it's all very silly, and even on easy mode, quite tricky. Not something I would go back to, though. Colditz is another game by Felix Software, and also advertised separately. It's described as a text adventure, and your aim is to escape and grab as much treasure as you can. It's a standard text effort, very simple room descriptions and simple commands. As you plod about, there are various things lying about that you can collect, but because the text is very sparse, you don't get any kind of enthusiasm, and the game just becomes boring. Let's move on then to their third release, Alien Swarm and Arena. Alien Swarm is a shoot 'em up, originally released by Titan Productions the year before. Well, it's a kind of shoot 'em up in a basic sort of way. Your huge spaceship moves around at the bottom of the screen far too fast to be accurate. The aliens move down the screen and gravitate towards you, and you shoot or dodge. There are different waves, each consisting of different passes. The number of invaders in each pass reduces as you proceed, until eventually you get to the next wave. The second wave of aliens drop bombs, making it even more difficult. It's all simple stuff though, and fun for about five minutes. On to Arena then, and this is a weird game. You stand in the middle of the screen, and depending on which level you're on, various things bounce around. These represent things like comets, laser bolts and spheres. You can rotate your shield through four positions and move left and right. And the object is you have to deflect the objects back. During the game, the walls move slowly in, and are deadly to touch. And to put them back to the edge of the screen, you have to score 100 points. A nice idea. A bit dull and repetitive, though. These three releases all received less than enthusiastic responses from the magazines. But I do like some of the artwork. Who is this guy? And I do like a good model. And what about this? It looks a bit like Robocop. Moving on, the final compilation, separate from the first three, arrived around June 1984. Diffusion and Worms, both by Lindenhurst Limited, and both previously released the year before. Diffusion is a bomb diffusing game. You move around and have to get to the bombs before the timer runs out. When you get there, another bomb appears on screen. The idea is good, but the keyboard response just kills this game. Everything works fine until you collide with the bomb, and then one or more of the direction keys don't work, and this means the chasing boot, yes I know, a sentient boot, anyway, the boot will get you and kill you. I then realise that you can only move in squares you haven't used before, but that doesn't improve things really, it's still frustrating. The chasing boot always catches you, you can't avoid it, it's because it just homes in on your position.
A good idea then, but badly implemented. Next we have Worms, originally called Magic Worm for its initial release. Yes, this is a worm game, but with a few twists. Level 1 and you have to move around, eating special parts of the worm's tail, and then head for the flashing thing. Level 2, and you have to collect the flowers, but avoid the rocks. Everything's dull and moves in character squares. Hmm. Level 3, and you have to get out of the maze by eating the flowers and not colliding with the walls. Mm. Level 4, and oh, I can't be bothered anymore. It's a nice twist on the standard snake game, but it looks like a type-in and plays like one too. The key response is terrible. Oh well. Things were not going to plan for KTEL, sales were not good, and the deal with DKtronics seems to have dried up and vanished. They decided to try something else. They changed their name to Frontrunner, and claimed it was to release software they had made themselves, which was a bit of a lie. They began to advertise different games though, and if this was a ploy to make people think that the quality would change, and that there was no connection with KTEL, well, it just didn't work. Under Frontrunner, they released three titles, all by other companies. There was Space Professor by Pinksoft, an educational title involving shooting numbers that are not the answer, Boiler House, a platform game, originally from Nova Trade, and here you have to control the pressure of boilers to stop them exploding, And probably the best known one, Boulder Dash, by First Star Software. Yes, you know the score here. Run around collecting diamonds. After this, KTEL never released another game on the KTEL label or Frontrunner label. And the last we hear of KTEL International is in March 1985. They announced they would be suspending funding for the Frontrunner label and then vanished. KTEL are still an active company, but their software days are way behind them. This is Street Hawk, released by Ocean Software in 1985, and this game has an interesting history, which we'll briefly touch on. The game is, for those not familiar with the 80s UK television shows, based on a series about a motorbike cop recruited to ride a top secret bike and do a spot of crime fighting in the process. Ocean grabbed the rights and set about producing a game, advertising it in magazines. Development was delayed though, and complaints started to flood in. Crash Magazine were advertising and selling their game via mail order, and were duly annoyed, so much so that they offered a replacement game for those that had ordered it. In the end, Ocean rushed out a bodged up game called Street Hawk Subscribers Edition to erase the complaints made by people that had originally ordered it. This game starts with helicopters. Yeah, I thought the series was about motorbikes. Next we have to shoot these helicopters as they fly up the screen for some reason. All done with a tinny sound effect. And each time you hit one, the green bar goes up at the bottom. Not sure why, I think it's something to do with fuel or shields. This is terrible. Next we come to what I thought was a joust clone. Until the game started. And then it was actually a joust clone. But with a scrolling screen. You drive around, jump on the platforms, shoot helicopters, large people suddenly appear for no reason I can discern, and smaller motorbikes drive around. It's just a complete mess. Once all of the enemies have been removed, it's back to the helicopter shooting section again. Very, very poor. The next year, Ocean had a new game written by Paul Owens, and finally released it in 1986. Well, at least the intro is better. No helicopters here. Once into the game, and we get a vertical scrolling drive and shooting game, a bit like Spy Hunter. It takes ages to get up to speed, during which time you can get rammed by other cars, or shot by the villains. Once at speed, you have to navigate up the road, avoid cars and shoot the enemy. The enemy cars are the ones shooting back at you.
If you hit something else, you get a message asking why you're shooting innocent people. If you get blocked, you can always jump over things like cars and bikes. The graphics are much more improved from the first version and nicely defined with some good background scenery. Sound is still a bit weak though, with a shooting and explosion sound that are very similar. You weave in and out of the traffic, and hopefully, if you don't get boxed in or lose all of your energy, you get to the next level. Here you have to shoot the robbers as they run out of the building and into their van. This level would be easy, but the coders decided that every shot, your gun sight would return back to the bottom of the screen again. This means you have to keep moving up to hit the men. Once complete, it's back on the road for another session of dodging and shooting. And that's about it, really. It's still a far better game than the first one, but I wouldn't call it a brilliant experience. This game could have been about any bloke on a motorbike, and apart from the name, you wouldn't know it was actually linked to the TV series. One to try out, maybe, but only for one game I would have thought. So today we're going to talk about games that are going for silly prices on eBay. And this was a Patreon question that got sent to Paul. It certainly was, and there's quite a lot of games, and there's quite a lot of reasons why they go for stupid prices. It's it's not all the same reason. It's, it's not because of one particular thing. So have you got any in mind, or shall, shall I kick off with some of the things, some of the ones that I've noticed? The ones I always seem to notice are the Ultimate ones. So the Ultimate Collection, which I have. Oh, and I've got a confession on that. A few years ago, I went back home and I found an, the unopened envelope of the tips, playing tips that came with the Ultimate Collection. Right. And I thought, oh, I may as well open this. I wonder what's inside. And I opened it. No, I... I I assumed it would make it more valuable, but I opened it, and then I think I threw it away, so I don't have it anymore. Oh, no. <laughs> now, that that will decrease the value. Have Did you I got put... the map? Uh, the poster. The poster, yeah. No, I put it up on my bedroom wall, and it disintegrated over time. Oh, so. It's losing um, value bit by bit. It's losing, losing value bit by bit. I still have the box. The box is in good condition. I still have the tips. Well, the, the ultimate titles in general hold their value quite well. Mm. They don't go for you know £1.50 or anything. You're looking yeah. at five pound four four ninety five something like that just for jetpack and cookie and that sort of thing, so I think they're yeah. holding their prices quite well. But the the later ones, as time went on, the later ones are going for more money, aren't they? Martinoids and Bubbler in particular seem to go for a huge amount. Yeah, I don't think they're particularly good games. No, I don't either. I mean, are they actually the Stampers games at that point? Because they they sold out, didn't they? And I I think word on the street is no, they're not. Because he sold out to US Gold. So um, I presume that their only value is because they want to complete the collection, and yeah. those those are the ones that are generally hard to get hold of. Complete everything. Which actually, actually brings us on, because you mentioned the ROM cartridges. ROM cartridges go for a lot. They do. As we know. And um, it's interesting as to why. I mean, I'm, I suppose there were, there were only, there's only 10 of them, isn't there? there well, aren't there, yeah. should I say? There are only 10 of them, aren't there? Yeah. And they produced them I presume in limited numbers because interface 2 wasn't really successful but I don't um, know, I don't know why they would go for I think I think you're looking at 60 pounds minimum for even things like chess and backgammon yeah and I think it's it's one of those things where retro game collecting has become more and more prevalent and that makes rare things even rarer because people jump on them and, and there's always a desire to get a complete collection, especially if there's only like 10 of them, like for the ROMs. Yeah. I mean, I've got everyone apart from Chess and Backgammon, and I'm not, re not really sure I want them. I mean, it's nice to have a complete set, but I, I don't play Backgammon or Chess, so <laughs> the only reason I would buy it is to complete the set. 
you were going to say the reasons why. Go on. What do you think the reasons why things become expensive, other than rarity, such as the wrong cartridges? Yeah, the reason number one is early titles, things that came out with an early inlay, and they later updated the inlay, which a lot of people will have, but the early ones, they were, um, particularly if they were mail order, would have early inlays. Th- things like the Microgen games had hand-drawn inlays to start with in two colours, black and red, and that was it. And then subsequently, after a year or so, the, uh, year or so they updated them to full colour ones. So the early ones um, do sell for a lot more than the, the later ones. Reason number two, sort of half-linked, is mail order games only. Some of the early games were only available by mail order. Classic example being Phoenix by Megadodo. Um, What's the difference between that and what you've just said? Because the Microgen titles were available in shops and stores. Ah, right, okay, as well. Yeah. As well as. But think something like Phoenix from Megadodo was only available mail order initially. It was picked up later by, I think, Alternative Software, who then put it into the shops. But the early releases go for stupid amounts of money. So you've then got... <laughs> uh, early titles that were produced by game companies that changed their name, the classic one being Spectrum Games. Okay, I've not noticed that. Go on, keep going. So So, so the Spectrum Game stuff, obviously Spectrum Games became motion software, and some of the titles followed them through like Frenzy, but the, uh, the Spectrum Games version was called Robotics. So those sort of things were, again, they were very, very early in the Spectrum's life, but the games and company changed. So they're, they're usually quite valuable as well. Do you have any of these? I do have some of the early games. I've got Microgen Scramble with an early cover. I haven't got any Spectrum games or Phoenix. What's the most valuable game you've got? Probably the Ultimate Collection. I can't think of anything else that's particularly valuable. I have have a complete set of the Ultimate ROM cartridges as well. Well, there you go. That's that's about Um, 300 quid there, isn't it? They've definitely increased in price, haven't they? (laughs) Yes. This is Coloco, released in 2020 by Tuxedo Games. Astronauts have become stranded on faraway planets and it's your job to rescue them. The job is difficult though, as there's gravity to contend with. You control the rescue pod and have to navigate through caverns to rescue the men and get them back again. Not only is there gravity to play with, but also inertia as well, which makes control very challenging. Once you get used to the controls though, you can make progress through the 30 screens of action. As you get further, things get harder, with levels that span multiple screens and moving enemies. Should you crash into any of the walls or an enemy, you will lose a life. All the time you're using fuel too, but this can be replenished at intervals, along with extra lives should you need them. This game reminds me very much of my own game, Deep Core Raider. The control is pretty much the same, although the ship does move faster in this game. Sound is well used and everything looks really nice. The game uses the Mojo Twins Curera engine, and if you are looking for a challenge, go and grab this one. This is Spectroprobe, released by Arctic Computing in 1983. Now many websites say that this is a 48k game, but it works just fine in 16k, and the inlay also mentions 16k. Being a 16k game, I don't know how many times I can say that, it's a simple affair. It's a lander style game where you have to land on a planet, moving at a speed that will not cause you to crash. To achieve this you use left, right and thrust controls. You are dropped randomly from the mothership and have two options. First you can grab some fuel by landing on it and then get to the platform to move to the next planet or you can go straight for the platform. The thrust control works differently than expected though. Instead of continually having to thrust to maintain your descent speed, 
you press it a few times until the speed drops below 10 and leave it there. You don't accelerate once you obtain the right speed. Now, based on the landscape and how much room you have, and how much fuel you have, you'll decide straight away to go for the pad or fuel. Once you have grabbed the fuel, you are then asked for a thrust value, and this will take you up by the number of character squares you choose, for example, 9. You can also safely land on flat ground, but it is tricky, as the detection is not always good. Each new planet does not refill your fuel either, so games will end quickly as there is simply not enough fuel to sustain a lengthy game. The height of the land is random each planet, sometimes being low down and giving you a lot of opportunity to grab fuel, some very high up. The graphics, as you can see, are simple. They move in character squares and the sound is just basic beeps. It's not actually a bad game for all that, I enjoyed smashing into the planet's surface again and again. If you are going to play it though, use the TZX file, which gives you instructions. Or, remember what the keys are. They are 5 and 8 for left and right, and Y for thrust. These are not mentioned on the inlay or any instructions online. I would say give this one a go if you think you can do better than me, which you probably can. The ZX Spectrum Next was a massive success on Kickstarter, and the second wave smashed through the one million pound barrier in days. Anyone who knows the machine knows it's a fantastic computer, and anyone who has backed the new campaign will be in for a real treat. If you haven't got a machine or aren't planning on one, you can experience the Next for yourself. There's an emulator that will allow you to do this, but, like all emulators, you don't get the feel for the machine itself. C-Spect is a very capable emulator, but it's tricky to set up. If you follow these guidelines, you should have your Spectrum Next emulation running smoothly and be able to enjoy some of the free games. The things you will need are the following downloads. The C-Spect emulator itself. Open AL to provide sound. An SD card image so you can boot. And some games. The first thing you need to do is extract all of the files from the C-Spec zip file into a folder of your choice. Then install OpenAL, that is if you want sound, I presume you do. And you place the downloaded SD card image file in the same folder as your C-Spec files. Now, to get C-Spec booting easily, it's best to create a batch file. Mine is called cspec.bat, so I can remember it. Now, add the following lines to it, which sets a few of the many command line options and also points to the name of your SD image file. So for example, my batch file looks like this. So obviously my image file is called cspec.image. The minus TV command turns off scan lines because I don't like them. If you don't want to install the sound drivers for whatever reason, you just add the minus sound command and all will be well. Cspec has many such settings that you can use during the launch process. And these include setting the speed, the screen size and joystick options. All of the options can be found in the readme.txt file in the cspec folder. Now if you double click the batch file you've just created, the Spectrum Next emulator should boot up and you're ready to go. Pressing space will enter the file browser and you can go and load a few things up. Now the tricky part, adding your own games. The SD image is the default boot image, so to be able to get new games onto it, you need to be able to access it. And one of the simplest and quickest ways I found is using an image mounting tool, such as OFS Mount. If you download this and run it, you'll be asked to select an image file. Select your boot image file, and remember to untick read only, and clicking mount will mount this into your operating system. And now you can treat it much like a USB pen drive. If you download some games from the Spectrum Next Games website, you can simply drag these into the folder games slash next, 
and it's recommended you put each game in its own folder for easy navigation. One thing to note, the games that you add will not appear in alphabetical order. That's not how SD cards work. The files and games will be listed in the order they were put in. Once complete, you must dismount the image. You can then go back into C-Spec, boot as normal, go into the browser, and your game should be there, ready to play. Now you can enjoy the Spectrum Next on your home computer. Although it is a far better experience with the real thing.